So firstly, of course, the projects are, are in now, and I think you've got a great uh, sigh of relief. And uh, it's, it's a lot of hard work, I recognize that. Um, as said right at the beginning of the term in this course outline, the project is far more work than is humanly possible by a single person. And so working in your groups of four or five was essential to, to pulling it off. And one thing that's, um, that's been consistent in the reviews that have been submitted so far is how relatively easy the group work has been for most groups. Uh, there's been one or two hiccups in some of the groups, but most of you uh, probably anticipated a far worse group experience than you actually ended up having. Um, certainly that was your sentiment from the reviews that you've been giving. So um, I want you to think a little bit about why that is. Um, we're not going to discuss it now, but mo for most of you, your group work has actually been a pretty good experience. It's not by accident. Um, there's been a number of things that have happened over the past three months that have led to that, hap to that being the outcome. And I want you just to reflect back on that um, later on next week, uh, you'll be t thinking about it and writing it down a bit in a review of the course. Um, and group work isn't easy. It's a skill that we learn. It's something we are always thrown into. And what was interesting was to see how many groups worked so well. There were a few instances where this was one of the few times I'd heard of groups where one person actually went to go do someone else's work and people getting upset about that. Usually the opposite happens. Someone has to do the work for someone who's not doing it. But this was a case, or several cases of that other, the opposite happening. So, but, but you learned some interesting group dynamics and I hope you, um, you benefited from that. I, this was a, an interesting quote. I got the first one here is from a current student here in the class. Okay, so one of your colleagues indicated that they've worked um, in Suncor, working on this project, this student says that they can say that this course is um, being one of the most practical projects they've done since studying ChemEng. Many of the applications are relevant to the oil and gas industry. I'm pretty sure that that relevance is beyond the oil and gas industry. Um, and then this role of economics. The second quote is from a, a student from last year who also uh, went to go work in the petrochemical industry. Um, and then just the indication there that it's starting to pull a, ho a lot of ideas together that makes, makes your work next year when you start working a whole lot easier. Okay, so I, I think this is not the only um, example of this. I hope that the project, my goal with the project is that it's, it's a learning experience and something that you benefit from. It's not just something to do a project for the sake of doing a project. And so um, that's very carefully managed through the course. The next piece of feedback I'd like to just get from you is um, a little bit about the troubleshooting that we've been doing the past few weeks. Uh, how did you feel the tutorials went this week compared to the tutorials the week ago uh, prior to that? When you didn't have a, a method to work from versus now when you do have a method to work with? About the same, no difference, Sean? My personal feeling is about the same. Yeah. Um, and from what I, I guess I saw in my group, I think a lot of us through the years have developed that approach, even if we don't explicitly think of doing it that way. That's right, yeah. So many of you have your own troubleshooting approach, and it might not gel with this, but you have an approach. just becoming comfortable to vocalize um, your thoughts. Okay, certainly the troubleshooting approach that we learn about the six phases are not intended to stifle any innovation and creativity that you have, right? They're not, it's not like thou shalt do it this way and that's the only way that works, right? As you've successfully proved to yourself, even before we did this method, you were able to uh, complete the troubleshooting without a systematic approach. So what we've done is given you a, a systematic approach that you might choose to take parts from and incorporate into your own way of doing things. You don't have to. No one's going to tell you that you must do it this way. It's certainly a way that's proven to work successfully. <laughs> and at the very least, by going through it and writing stuff down, it forces you to document 
what's going through your mind. Okay? And that's an important role because an important skill because when you troubleshoot practical problems, unless they're the problems that need to be diagnosed in 10, 15 minutes, um, these are typically problems that you'll diagnose over two, three days, maybe even a week. And you're not going to be doing it on your own. So the role, the, the skill of writing down what you've done and how you've systematically gone and eliminated root causes to share that with the people you're troubleshooting with is, is an essential part. Okay? So um, at the very least, learn, take that from, from it. So let's um, go back to where we ended then on Wednesday's class. Wednesday's class, we had uh, this up on the board, and we had essentially solved the problem. Now, I rec I'm starting to see here this isn't quite as clear as I'd hoped it would come out. Um, but there were essentially two root causes left there. Airflow too low was the second one. So I'll just write it down out here if it's not clear. Airflow too low. And then the other one was related to the controller tuning. And we ended off the class by doing a small experiment. So what I'll do is, uh, rather than showing you the, that, that that's not showing so clearly, let's uh, just redraw that because this is going to be essential to our understanding here. So we had this system up with fuel flow. and TC1, the temperature that we're trying to control. And we had said there that we'd observed that, I'll show the second step we, we made, we, we stepped up in fuel flow, and we started to notice that the temperature, um, the temperature was kept constant, and then started to drop off. Okay. So that's with the feedback controller on. Then we said, Let's go to manual. Okay, so let's move to manual mode. And we observe that that, that would happen. So now in manual mode, your fuel flow is where it is. Sorry, I'm, my mistake here. Uh, Let me start this a little bit lower. Fuel flow started to rise. That was the problem. Fuel flow started to rise. And when we put the control loop in manual, we stay where we are. And then there was the suggestion to do a step test. And we stepped up and back down again. And what happened was fuel flow stepped up, temperature dropped. And then when we stepped the fuel back down again, temperature rose. Okay. And I'd ask you just to think a little bit about that last at the end of the class, why, why that happens. Okay. And the root cause of that was, is actually a combination of both of these. The airflow being too low, as was suggested really early on in, um, when we were brainstorming ideas, as well as the controller tuning. Okay, let's, just t let's just try to understand a little bit about this. Um, the airflow being too low is one part of the problem, and then the other part is the control loop itself. How do these two come together? Well, let's bear in mind that when we're burning fuel, we have to supply a certain amount of air to, to keep it burning, and we have a stoichiometric ratio that we have to obey. Okay, so if we're at that stoichiometric ratio, we're going to have a certain temperature what happens if we add excess air? Temperature will 
temperature drops a little bit, not, not severely, but your excess air now, this extra air that you're adding into this fired heater, also has to be heated up. Okay, so you're putting air in, heating it up, and that air just goes out. So that heat capacity of the air needs to be um, taken into account, and so your temperature will actually drop. What happens when you have below the stoichiometric ratio of air? So you, you back off on your airflow. Temperature drops, so it drops fairly dramatically. Okay. So we've got an, a nonlinear issue here. Right? We typically operate in this zone. Okay, this is where we operate with excess air. And that's where we've tuned our controller. Our controller expects that we're operating in this region. And the regular tuning of the controller, the, the normal behavior, of your control loop is if you change your fuel flow up that the temperature goes up. Okay, so you, if you're operating with excess air, so normal behavior, i.e. excess air, the regular behavior is that adding more fuel to the system will lead to an increase in temperature. So what's happened over here when we observe this situation? Okay. So your temperature actually drops when you increase fuel. Let's maybe redraw that um, curve. I've drawn it with airflow on the horizontal axis, but we could equally well have drawn it here with fuel flow. and temperature and the assumption is for a fixed airflow okay so there's a third variable here we've got temperature fuel flow and airflow so if we fix airflow we can now look at the effect of temperature and fuel flow and here's that stoichiometric ratio is again so we're at some nominal temperature when we're at the stoichiometric ratio. When that fuel flow increases, what happens to temperature? So you add more fuel. Up or down? Down, okay. So you're adding more fuel than, would, than can be combusted. If you add... Um, if you back off on your fuel flow, keeping your air fixed, what happens then? Also goes down, okay? Which side are you on normally? The left-hand side, okay? So this is the side of excess air. And that's the side of, of oxygen starved. Yep. Okay. okay, so when you're operating normally on the right-hand side, you get exactly this. You increase fuel, you add more fuel, your temperature goes up. But what we ended up doing is we took another step and we landed out over there and temperature started to go the other way. And then we added more fuel, the feedback controller says, well, my normal tuning algorithm, the regular tuning algorithm is to get the temperature up, add more fuel. So temperature's dropping, we'll add more fuel. We keep shifting over there. Okay, so that explains the engineering behind that particular case study. But we now need to get to stage five and six where we figure out a short-term and a long-term solution. Yeah, Mark? Is it possible to tune the controller um, that if the temperature went out to like, tune it the other way, like to get back to the center? 
Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about how to do, fix it up for a short-term and a long-term long solution. Uh, what I will say here is right now, here we've got our gain is going to be positive, and what we've ended up moving into is a system where the gain is negative, right? But the controller doesn't know that. The process gain has flipped sign on you, but the, the controller doesn't know that. Um, in the problem set that there's a weird smell coming from like the pump, is that just irrelevant information, or is that features of the incomplete question? It could be either one. Yeah, I, if, it, if it came from the pump, it, might, it was, I think, upstream from the fuel tank, uh, from the feed tank, not from the fuel. So yeah, there will always be irrelevant information. Everyone will have an opinion on what the problem is. And so it's sifting through that as well. Okay, so that, let's take a look now. If you were faced with this problem at this particular point, right? so you've, you may have figured this out, that there's a, this problem with the control loop. Or certainly you've figured out at the very least um, these two are just a restatement of each other. This one is more the outcome as a result of part two. Okay, so what can you do to fix this as a short term? If you were an operator or you were working with the operator, what would your instructions be to do next? Increase airflow to the heater. Which is to the, uh, drop back down in feed flow. Yeah. Okay. But I want, so suggestion to drop back down in feed flow is suggestion to increase the oxygen. What state is that fired heater in? There's unstable, there's excess fuel in there. Okay, so you've been ramping up fuel. Okay, so you probably want to avoid ramping in oxygen and combusting it. Um, it's the default that even a safety interlock system would do. If you designed an SIS system, the SIS default is to shut fuel down, add oxygen. Right? And that here is an example of where the SIS system for this particular state may not be the most appropriate action. Dr. Marlin had this case study reviewed by a fired heater expert and that was his big criticism of the case study is that it lends you to think that opening the oxygen is a good way to solve this but you actually have to resist that temptation of just undoing what happened there. So airflow too low, the temptation is well let's go back to what it should be, make the airflow high. Um, you have to think through what the implication of your short-term action is. A short-term action is going, has to be taking into account the prior operation of the process. Okay, so it's not always um, the best course of action to do what, you, what your gut feel is. Okay, so just think through what the state of the process is. Dropping back on the, on the feed flow, um, there is, is probably realistic. You want to reduce the feed coming into the process, stabilize this first, and then, then go back to figuring out um, how to adjust the feed. So what was the root cause? Like, if you could say a few things to cause this problem, what caused the problem and how it could have been avoided? What might that be? So we've got a, a cause there that the airflow was too low, but that doesn't happen by itself. What, what, if you had to make t a recommendation or two to your boss, what would that recommendation be? So discuss it quickly. What would you recommend to avoid this problem from ever occurring? This is a very dangerous situation.
Yeah, so how can you... What's the objective function? You know the airflow is moving past the Okay. Okay, but do you need an RTO to do that? Yeah. No. It's a very simple system. Okay. Yeah. Okay, some suggestions of what you can do to avoid this from happening. There's, the, there's at least four or five things that could have prevented this from occurring. Yeah, Mark? Okay, if you need to ramp up the feed flow, you know that you're going to need more fuel, but first your suggestion is to ramp up the air first and then ramp up your fuel. Okay, so if you look back at your drawing, there's no control loop between the airflow and the fuel. Okay, so it indicates that this is a manual step. The operator is responsible for ensuring excess air going in. And the operator probably forgot to step that air flow up. Several suggestions, Brent? Uh, put a boundary on the maximum step size. On the maximum step size for fuel? Okay, so have a, a PLC clamp on the fuel flow so you can't exceed that. Devin, come back here. A feed forward control between the airflow and the fuel flow. Okay, let's hold that thought. Yeah, Dennis. Uh, and then you have like a composition controller on the stack. So if it notices like fuel gas is starting to accumulate, you close that valve more. Okay, composition con uh, measurement on the stack and then for which components? Okay, composition of the fuel gas, composition of oxygen. Compo what happens when you're burning um, oxygen starved? What do you start to observe in the, f in the stack? Carbon monoxide, okay? So any one of those or a combination of those, oxygen, CO, um, or fuel measured in the, in the stack gases, okay? So those are all valid suggestions and alarms. So when you have your stack on your fired heater, you've got a composition analyzer, you'd have an AAL or AAH. So you want to make sure a low level alarm for oxygen, a high level alarm for CO. Okay. So alarms would, would certainly have gone a long way to preventing that from occurring. Now we can also, um, look at a far more complex system. So here's, um, here's what's actually done on a fired heater to ensure that we never get to this state. It's a messy control system. This is well beyond the level that we learn about in this course. But this is just for the fuel and just for the air. Okay, And what it is, we'll see uh, several, several features in there. There's um, oxygen and CO both coming in. We need one or the other. You can't control just based on oxygen and you can't control just based on CO. The reason is if you're controlling purely on excess oxygen and you're going towards an oxygen starved environment, O2 is eventually going to reach zero and then it clamps at zero. It's basically that, that sensor reads a zero to you and, but then CO starts to ramp. So when oxygen is low, CO will go up and then vice versa. So we take the larger of the two. Either we want to see oxygen or we want to see CO. And then depending on that, we will adjust. How are we going to adjust it? Well, we're going to first um, ramp up the air and then ramp up the fuel. So there's, there's a need for that in here. So there's a, a feed forward controller to first boost air, then fuel. And then there's a ratio control to make sure that the ratio is always kept in. Okay, so it's, a, it's not an obvious control system, it's certainly not one that you would know how to plan or design, um, but this is a standard in this sort of industry. Okay? So that's a longer term solution that will automatically take care of it. If you choose not to do it automatically, you would use um, interlocks and PLC code just for some basic bounds. Yes? Where 
Why is, why is are the calculations? Okay. Yeah, and so that's why you have a greater than, less than, or square root there for it. Or division for the ratio. Okay. So why is a calculation? Okay, so important is, and I'll guarantee you in almost you'll never do this. Right? In your company, you get pushed so fast to go to the next problem that you'll never have a chance to really actually sit back and figure out approach to implement to avoid this permanently. It will always be a short-term fix and then you just move on to the next problem. Companies don't seem to have that mindset for longer-term improvements, but we should try to do that and answer this question. How can we prevent this in the future? And because this costs a lot of money and time is why it's never done. Training, retrain or train your operators to avoid um, a, a protocol where they can create a dangerous situation from occurring. Monitoring programs require sensors, they require computer coding, and it's, it's trivial for me and you to say, well, just put a line of PLC code in there. But it's, it's not like that, right? When you just put a line of PLC code in there, it's signed off by two or three managers. It has to be validated, check that it actually works. It can often turn into a week's worth of work for multiple people. Um, modifications to the plants and equipment. Now you're seriously pushing your boss, right? Oh, I want you to modify the process. I want you to modify the equipment. That almost certainly isn't going to happen. But um, this, is, this is what we're aiming for and striving for. And you would certainly do this for very critical safety issues. Okay. So, any questions on the troubleshooting sequence here so far? Uh, sorry, the question about yeah. the troubleshooting sequence is more uh, for the long term solution. Like, if you're trying to pitch a long term solution for a, like a safety situation to your boss, yeah. how do you give the economic uh, like benefit of averting a disaster? Like, do you just break down the Okay, how, do you, how would you go about an economic pitch to your boss? And that's the right way to go about it because that's the language that your boss will understand. Suggestions for how you might approach that? Devin? Okay, mention how much it would have cost if it does happen. You may, have, you may know what it costs already from prior experiences or from if you're in a larger company, it might have happened elsewhere. Okay, that, if that fired heater has exploded out now, how much it would take to get a new one in there, the last production time? Yeah. Like the responsibility of knowing about the problem, if it causes unsafe conditions, and if that does occur, like the, the, the moral consequences. The moral consequences, the ethical consequences of knowing that that unsafe situation is embedded there in your process with the potential to occur. Whether it actually does or not, you now have that knowledge that there's a possibility that it could work occur um, and that might not sway your boss <laughs> but um, the the monetary side might might do that okay any other comments here before we move on to the next section which kind of does lead in a way to ethics and um, professionalism so we'll talk a bit about the PEO first in the handout that you have um, Anyone not have a copy? 